the nation, when I was in, blamed the soldiers. We were baby killers and village burners, and there were movies like Platoon and Apocalypse Now, and that was a reflection of the Vietnam soldier. Uh, we were pot-smoking, hippie guys. The, the first movie that really showed what and how courageous these guys were was We Were Soldiers that Hal Moore and Joe Galloway, based on their book, told this love story about what guys will do for each other, not for some political whatever, but for survival and because you care about the guy next to you in that foxhole. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. Well, I went to a land-grant college, and back in the 50s and 60s, uh, all males who went to land-grants colleges had to take ROTC two years. Uh, the first two years, your freshman and sophomore year, you took ROTC. And then your junior, senior year, you had an opportunity to take advanced ROTC. Um, so I signed up, not because I wanted to get in the military, but because they paid you. And um, it was a direct commission. So once I graduated, I had a job. Back then, because of the state of the nation, African Americans weren't being hired in too many jobs, so the military seemed like a, a, a good one. I had no intention of staying, but one thing led to another. I got some good assignments. I've had some choice assignments. Um, I was stationed in the Old Guard, and I commanded the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, uh, stationed in Berlin. I only had three bad years in, of duty. And those were when we were in Vietnam. We went to Vietnam by ship. We left Charleston, sailed through the Panama Canal, and landed in uh, Queen Yon, and then traveled by truck up to An Khe, which was our base camp, and that's where we operated out of. The, the first um, operations that we were doing were just search and destroy. So we were looking for, um, trying to familiarize ourselves, get acclimated to the climate. And then in um, November of 1965, I was doing convoy security on along hi on, uh, along a uh, highway got a call from my battalion commander that I was being attached to the 7th Cavalry uh, to, to deploy to um, the Eardrang Valley. And this was part of the play coup campaign. They had discovered some, um, what they thought were v v Viet Cong. Unfortunately, they were North Vietnamese regulars, and so, um, I flew into uh, an LZ Columbus and then walked overland into LZ X-Ray. And this is where the Battle of the Eardrang, and uh, which has been the subject of a number of books and a movie. Um, I was attached. The, the commander of that unit was Hal Moore, and I'm sure you know, all, you, you have all this history. I came in the second day of the battle. The rest of the battalion was flown in. I walked into the to the battle, spent two nights there, woke up on the third night. I woke up the morning of the third day, and they told us that they were going to put B-52 strikes on the LZ. So we had to get outside of a safety box, and that box was three miles. They had a box around the target area was which, which three miles. So we were, the rest of the battalion was flown out. Um, I was then reattached to the second of the seventh and we walked out. After two nights of, of uh, intense combat, you wake up the next morning and the guy, and, and because we're an air mobile unit, uh, you think you're gonna get flown out and the commander tells you that you're going to have to walk out. 
uh, although my guys were 1-1 one, one Bravos, they weren't used to a lot of walking because every time we, we would move and the helicopters would always be there to pick us up and take us home. The anticipation was that after these two nights of battle, we were going to go home. Uh, and when we were told that you're not going to be flown out, you're going to walk out, and oh, by the way, you're going to be the last ones out of the un out of the organization, I mean, out of the combat area. So it was not a good day. Uh, but being the, the skilled leader that I was, I thought, I pepped them up and told them there's, there's still a, we're still going to get picked up once we get to, to uh, Albany. This video is sponsored by 4Patriots.com. 4Patriots has made it their mission to ensure that we are all prepared for any situation or environment. No matter what situation you find yourself in, you can trust that 4Patriots will have your back. ABC has this crazy team member that likes to go out in the mountains and run for days and days and days. So in his base camp, he wants some quick and easy electricity. He regularly uses the Patriot Power Generator 2000X when he's out in the mountains and in other obscure locations. That power pack uses the endless free power of the sun to power your lights, your TV, medical equipment, or even your fridge. Plus, it's expandable and comes with a free solar panel. We had the folks at 4Patriots set up a special page for you at 4Patriots.com forward slash ABC so you can see any deals or any specials that they're running at this time. Go to 4Patriots.com forward slash ABC to support this video. The mission was to, to secure the LZ and wait for a pickup. We, we, they didn't have enough aircraft to take everybody out of X-ray, so we were moving to an alternate landing site, a more secure landing site. Um, and that, that was the purpose of the mission, to move to that landing site. We got to a point where um, we could see the LZ, the battalion commander, called all of the company commanders forward, I guess to position us, because we always fought these battles in perimeters. It was like in the, the old days when they circled the wagons, everything inside was good and everything outside was bad. Um, unfortunately, just before I arrived at the briefing, uh, the North Vietnamese sprung an ambush. Um, I was separated from my company, uh, traveling with my two RTOs, radio telephone operators, who are always, you, you reach for the headphone and they're always there. Um, the safest place for me, because I didn't know any of the other people in that battalion, Safest place for me was back with my company because I had trained with them and I knew where all my NCOs and officers were. Um, in an attempt to get back to my unit, um, I got up from my position, uh, started to negotiate my way back to my unit, lost both of my radio operators, um, uh, I'm not sure, and this, this, these are some of my demons that I have to deal with, is I don't know whether I left them or they were killed as we were making the, negotiating our way back to the, um, to my unit. Um, because that's where all of my guys were, my NCOs, my XO, um, and all of my platoon leaders. I fortunately made it back, uh, organized the unit. We spent the night there. During the night, we sent out some um, troops to, to rescue some of the people who were caught in the, uh, the, uh, the, the ambush. A number of guys in the second of the seventh, that unit was um, combat ineffective because of the number of casualties. I lost 17, had 42 wounded, and one MIA. One of the 
most heroic acts that I witnessed is my medic, uh, Daniel Torres. When I when I sent when we got the call that there were wounded soldiers in an ambush site, um, about around midnight, uh, we got a call on the radio from uh, call sign Ghost Four Six that he was in the ambush site, wounded. There were lots of wounded guys in the ambush site, and the, the, the North Vietnamese were coming through and executing. So I, I was gonna go out and try to bring them back. My, one of my platoon sergeants said, sir, you can't go out on a patrol with the rest of the company back here. So I sent out um, a, a squad with some stretchers and when they got there, they didn't have enough stretches to bring everybody back. So somebody had to stay behind. Uh, my medic, Daniel Torres, stayed behind and guarded those guys through the night and the next morning we went out and rescued them. We went in, recovered most of the bodies. Uh, the one MIA that I the one tr troop that I couldn't account for, uh, we didn't find him until the next year. Um, we f moved into the LZ. We were picked up and flown back to uh, On K. Spent Thanksgiving and went out the next, that Monday on another operation. When you tell war stories, it's all hindsight, because if you had known what you know now, you probably wouldn't have been in that situation. But in hindsight, I wondered why the commander, because we had excellent communications, why, why he just didn't do radio communications and tell us where he wanted us to be positioned on this perimeter, instead of separating commanders from their unit uh, with their communications. So it was a bit unsettling, but captains don't question colonels. When the colonel tells you to go, you salute and click your heels and you go. And um, you lament the fact that it wasn't a very good idea because 17 young, who knows what they could have been, got killed because of that one bad decision. You know, war is, is hell. But one of the benefits of the Vietnam War is how military, how people view the military now. When we came home from Vietnam, there were no parades. We were told when we got on the plane get out of your uniforms because when you land in San Francisco or wherever you landed, don't expect to get welcomed home. Compare that to today, you can't turn on a NFL football game without soldiers and, and, and I envy these guys for that. But that's one of the lessons that the nation learned. The, the nation, when I was in, blamed the soldiers. We were baby killers and village burners, and there were movies like Platoon and Apocalypse Now, and that was a reflection of the Vietnam soldier. Uh, we were pot-smoking, hippie guys. That, the, the first movie that really showed what and how courageous these guys were was we were soldiers. That Hal Moore and Joe Galloway, based on their book, told this love story about what guys will do for each other, not for some political whatever, but for survival, and because you care about the guy next to you in that foxhole. So the, the, the beauty of the war, if there is a beauty, 
is it gave America a better appreciation of what young guys like you will have to do if there is a war. And you need to, to, to show that it's not, soldiers do what the country wants them to do. They salute, they go, they fight, they die, and they expect to come home uh, to a good life. Unfortunately for the Vietnam soldiers, a lot of these guys are still fighting the battles, and you see it at, when, when you see guys walking around with Stetson hats and whatever, they're living in the past. I used to, when I was a young kid, I, I would, growing up in a small town, Fourth of July was always parades. And I used to see these old vets hobbling down the street. And I'm going, why are these guys doing that? 30 years later, that was me. 